Welcome to this podcast series on neo-charismatic leadership with author, leadership expert and coach, Dr. Gada Angawi and executive leader, Martin Headley, where they will both explore the recently published book, Neo-Charismatic Leadership and the coaching topics it covers. I am so happy that we got to interview three leaders so far in our podcast. Yes, Gada. Um, each of the leaders has been instructive in their own way and have really added a lot of value in pinpointing the difference that near charismatic leadership embodies. Greater age and experience does not correlate with better leadership. In fact, the opposite is true to some extent, uh, a fact that was beautifully illustrated recently in podcasts and postings by Jack Zenger and Joe Fogman, who uh, have been in the extraordinary leader business for quite some time. What seems to be common among our three interviewees is the ability to formulate a shared vision, not the length of time they've been working on something or how well they were able to sell an idea. Over the last three months, we've been discussing stage one, the search for opportunity, where leaders spend time in assessing the environment, sensing people's needs and challenging the status quo with a decision that transforms the life of the organization or their community. Now, we need to break down how to formulate that shared vision. Yes, today we are going to look at stage two, formulating a shared vision with two unique roles. The first of which, how to formulate that shared vision. And the second is articulating the vision. We are very excited about this stage as the leader through stage one has the support and resources they need from their organization and have managed to gain the trust and collaboration of their followers. Some people may still see these leaders in a negative way and feel emotional about the transformation that is happening as it has disrupted the norms of their lives. It may be personal or professional impact or both, and some privileges they may have lost as a result. The leader feels under great pressure to achieve what they have promised, and they know that people are watching. Indeed, Gada, the pressure to produce is strong, uh, but none of us can affect a lot of change by ourselves. The strength of our shared vision with others, motivating and engaging followers becomes even more important. Transformation, which I've been doing for many years, is not just changes to policies and procedures. It's people changing. And if they're not enrolled, they won't change or, or they'll barely change. And that won't get any of us anywhere. So you know, we've got to look at why this pressure is there. So in a way, which we've done is we have we've made a statement. We've, we've, we've created an opportunity and now something has to be done about it. And people are looking back at us. So now we've got to get them on board, even though they like where we're going, we've got to convince them that there is a direction. I noticed that as we come out of the pandemic, or as, as it's slowly reducing, uh, many governments are making bold commitments to recover from COVID with a green agenda in support of climate change. Well, that's great. And we've seen some dramatic um, proclamations that should inspire a lot of people to lead new ways of doing things. But this is where it gets scary for leaders, especially when we're in a situation where our leadership is limited, you know, perhaps political leadership or even in a company you don't you don't lead forever. Um, the engagement needs to be enduring and it needs to last beyond our own terms. In a way, it's going to become part of our legacy. So it better happen. And, and this increases the pressure. Now, in my experience, this is the most intense time of soul searching and self-doubt a leader goes through. I have witnessed two incidents that proves this role to be effective in leading transformation and ethical in the same time. The first is when a new charismatic leader in a large organization had to announce a strategic decision that affected the life of everyone in the organization, but was the only way to save it. Without the luxury of time to go through formulating a shared vision, as we discussed before. And, in, and if you are allowed enough time to run a parallel process of, of the role, I mean, like I mentioned before, with 
with everything else that's happening in stage one, this is great. But if you don't have the time, you're really in, in a tight situation. But, but that is not always the case. As I said, this leader had to, had to announce that decision and, and was confronted with rage and anger. And, you know, a lot of emotions went into, into that situation. A huge resentment to the leadership team as well. But they have already prepared and anticipated before the announcement by putting proper plans in place to formulate the shared vision immediately after the announcement. And immediately, an upward process of workshops of vision formulation across the organization was in place. Uh, it saved the situation. It didn't finish in three months, like in your situation, because this was a drastic uh, decision and a large organization. It took over a year or two. It, it's important. There is a lot of healing that happens when people talk about their emotions. But the leaders played an integral role in these workshops. They did not just ask for these workshops to happen and assign uh, external consultants or trainers to run them. They were involved in them day in and day out as time permits. So it was a distributed leadership task over a, a big group of executives uh, and board of, uh, of trustees. And they came down and they were with the, with the people in the front line and in middle management and, and in everywhere in the organization to help uh, facilitate the process. The second incident was for a department in a corporation where the department vision was non-existent. Uh, so there was a corporate vision, there was a corporate strategy, and there were a department in that corporation that had over 250 employees and uh, their leaders at different levels, but it didn't have its own vision. They were just following the corporate vision, which is a normal thing. And it's important to have the corporate vision in place, but people felt distant from the vision. And then there was a transformation happening. The level of transformation was not drastic, but there were things that were giving to them on their level to implement. People didn't like it. So the leaders were talking to me in the team coaching space and they were saying people are resentful and resisting the change. So I suggested that they do the uh, formulating a shared vision process. They did it in a creative way to accommodate all the change and the transformation that was happening that motivated people and gave them purpose to continue. They did it in a way from the front line, people from really basic jobs. And it was something that was shared and declared across the floor, the organizational floor. And the leaders went down and walked the floor. So they were engaged in the process daily. And that really, really helped. It was fascinating to watch that transformation. Not only people adapted, but they adopted. Many that I have coached have told me the same. You know, you work so hard to find an opportunity, uh, explain why it is worth going for. And now you've got a lot of people engaged, ready to work with you to achieve it. This was the time when I truly had to make the vision theirs and no longer mine. So I had to deliver, yet let go at the same time. And when you've got two very strong opposing forces, you have stress. Was I leading people down a fruitless path? What if it's all for nothing? I mean, the questions play around in your head constantly, and it, it, it's actually quite annoying. And of course, my very credibility was on the line. Your credibility as a leader is on the line at this point. So in time, we learn to let go by building that shared vision that is so strong. After a few months, nobody can really tell where that vision came from because the, the followers are totally engaged. But that's OK. We then find there are different big tasks ahead of us, including keeping the motivation and celebration of discoveries going. So the team is now working on our shared vision and we, dare I say it, can relax a bit. Not only that, Martin, but there are many great tasks ahead for leaders Although time may seem a stretch as the transformation will take a year or two or more, the new charismatic leader knows that to get there, time moves very quickly and they must work diligently with their team and the other teams if anything of what you promised is to happen. Yes. So this is where formulating a shared vision is so important. I remember having taken a team working in a global bank through a process that challenged the status quo. It had taken three months to keep selling the idea. And the focus, of course, was on much improved customer experience. Once we had the agreement to proceed, it suddenly felt like, oh, no, 
Now we've actually got to do it. It was fun getting everybody to think of the possibilities and the improved outcomes. But now we had to do it. Formulating the shared vision then isn't a meeting or two, and it's certainly not an announcement. So over the following three months, I found myself constantly bringing the team back to the original stated goals. Why? They all agreed in the direction, right? Well, reality had stepped in during that three months and followers were beginning to find reasons or roadblocks on what was achievable. So the objectives and emotional reasons for sticking to the plan had to be repeated many times until the team understood they had to find a way. Repetition and trial and error led everyone on the team over the first three months to this common shared vision. And it was then and only then that I could go and start working on some new objectives. You, you mentioned that it was um, it's a matter of time. You know, time does move quickly. And I'm, so here I'm sitting here saying, oh, but it actually takes three months. These things actually work together, which is yet another reason why there is so much stress in this particular part of the cycle. I'm happy that you shared this example. Now we can look at different pockets of what formulating a shared vision means for leaders in reality. You know, you look at the model, it looks linear, but it's not. Uh, and I encourage our listeners to download the model from, from the website so they can see the infographic and how the model interact with each other. The roles specifically are cyclic. The leaders jump from one role to another. And what you have described is very true. It is not enough that a decision is made at the top. The decision is provisional when it's made, when challenging the status quo happens as a role and the decision is declared, it is not the end. It's a provisional decision and the decision must be adjusted to suit the shared vision, which is going to come in the process. Sometimes it happens before challenging the status quo because leaders have enough time on their hand and sometimes they don't. They're under pressure to declare the decision and then they have to go through the process of uh, formulating a shared vision. In the first place, even though you made a decision that will transform the life of the organization and you have assessed the context, assessed the uh, people needs, you may not have the luxury or chance to formulate the shared vision with them. So here comes your opportunity to do that in reality. Right, right. So it, it's never actually too early to start. And I would say it's never actually too late to start either. So let me explain that a bit, because, you know, if you're in a position where the decision hasn't been made, you can still be getting people to to join in, to discuss the vision, to help decide how one might get there. Uh, so that when the decision is made, you're partway down this road. But even if you haven't considered it, the decision has been made, an announcement has been made, you still have to do this. So my advice is that we should have a plan to build the shared vision immediately after the announcement or the decision. Preferably don't make the decision until you've got that plan. And there are three reasons why. Firstly, even your most excited followers don't think it's real until you get the go ahead. So all of the talk before was fun, it was nice and it was enjoyable and everybody was agreeing with you, but it wasn't real and now it is. Secondly, um, there are naturally going to be barriers. So personal resolve gets challenged. So this at a stressful time, now it's coming back at you, which only exacerbates that little voice in the back of your head every night that says, oh, am I still doing the right thing? And thirdly, we know we can't, we as leaders can't move on to anything else until the team is solid in the shared vision. You know, until you don't need to go back to them on a weekly basis or a daily basis to find out if they're still going in the right direction, if they're just pushing barriers out of the way to achieve, or whether they're still letting barriers limit their thinking. So we have to spend time to cement that vision in place. Everyone needs to know it as well as we do. And as circumstances change and perhaps a slightly different direction is needed, the shared vision needs to be adjusted as well. So creating the shared vision is a continual activity. It's not something that's going to go away. Uh, just because we did it before doesn't mean we can skip it. 
when we modify again. Yeah, I, I totally agree, Martin. The formulation of a shared vision is not a one-in-a-lifetime event that happens only when there is a strategic transformation decision to be made or a new institution to be established. It has to be a cyclic following evaluation uh, and uh, following uh, execution. So there is a cycle whereby you formulate a shared vision, you plan how to implement that vision you execute that plan and then you evaluate and then you go back to reassessing the vision itself and, and it changes over time. Yes, it, you know, I think some clarity is important when people are trying this for the first time or they're experiencing this for the first time. You know, you mentioned multiple departments having sort of unique visions and, and they're, they are in fact having their own mini visions hopefully as part of the bigger vision of the of the bigger organization. I have seen places where I, I've been coaching where each department had a different vision and it really deviated quite a bit from the corporate vision. Well that doesn't that doesn't help in the long run. That that will actually create a lot of frustration because you'll keep trying to do things and and the organization will say no, that's not what we want. But it is good to bear in mind though that if the individual departmental teams are not bought into a vision of some sort, then you're not going to get very far. And yet, if they're all individual visions, you're going to get anarchy and that that's the complete opposite of what you need. So we're looking for this balance between empowerment of our teams within an overall direction for the organization. But the, the second point I wanted to make here is about uh, timing. Um, I mentioned three months to establish a shared vision. Uh, and people I'm coaching often say, well, I don't have that much time. And maybe that's just the way we say it as coaches. I don't know. But my answer is you do. From the moment of the decision, you spend the next three months working the project while at the same time establishing the shared vision. Okay? You don't stop, establish the shared vision and then move on again. Right. So the same is true when you adjust the vision as well. Yeah, very, very true. I have stated in my book that vision formulation and articulation or stage two is a cyclic uh, ongoing process, as I said, and um, I would love that really people uh, download the, the model so that they can uh, visualize what this means. And to your point, it is very important that the mini visions should be in sync with the corporate vision or the whole organization vision and, and derived from it in a way that touches people's values and hearts. We are uh, burning daylight and I think uh, our episode is about to end. So uh, thank you. Garda and Martin, hope you enjoyed this episode. There is more information available at neocharismaticleadership.org. And if you would like to discuss coaching or training for yourself or your team, you can contact Garda and Martin through the website. We look forward to your participation next week. Until then, goodbye.